Cyber security and cyber security breaches remain front and center. They're in the news almost every day of the week. And so for the 17th year in a row, Verizon is giving us the 7,000 foot view of what's going on. They are giving us the big picture of what's happening, how it's happening, who's responsible, and what we can do about it. This year's report uh, studied 30,000, more than 30,000 incidents, 10,000 data breaches in 94 different countries, very comprehensive. Here to kick things off is Kyle Malady. He is CEO of Verizon Business. Kyle. Thank you, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to the session today, both here and on the, uh, on the web, on LinkedIn. I appreciate the time. Today's an exciting day for Verizon for really two reasons. First, it's actually dividend day, so if you are a holder of Verizon stock, you will get a little treat today in terms of uh, overall $2.7 billion in dividends, so that's always a proud day for us. And then secondly, super proud and why we're here today is to talk about DBIR, uh, which, as you, as you point out, is the 17th year in a row that we've put out this, uh, this material that has really become a, um, really a go-to if you're in the cybersecurity uh, industry. And so we're super proud that we're able to put that out. And, and why, what gives us the, the street cred to be able to put this out and why is it so widely accepted? It's really because of folks like the two sitting to the left of me here with Nazrin and Chris and the, the great people we have inside of Verizon that understand cyber very, very deeply, analysts, um, engineers, and the like. But not only do we have people who are really capable to understand this, we run big networks. So we run huge networks in North America, in EMEA, in APAC, and we have this expertise and we also have uh, the technology and the day-to-day -day working in the networks so we can see what's going on. So I know this is highly anticipated with a lot of folks in the community, and so we're super happy to be here today to talk to you about it. Uh, as with all of the other previous 16, there's really interesting information that we see. It never, it never surprises us, but the... The interesting thing is, if you're an engineer and technology person, it changes every single year, and we have some great, uh, great insights to show you that hopefully you can use for your businesses to move your, your, uh, your business forward. So with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks for being here, and I look forward to conversation. Thanks, Kyle. Let me introduce the other panelists. We have with us Nazrin Razai. She is Senior Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer of Verizon. Also here, Chris Novak, Managing Director of Cybersecurity Consulting at Verizon Business. Chris, you're the data guy. <laughs> I want you to give us the big picture. What are the key findings from this report? Sure. So there's a, there's a lot of interesting things that came out of this year's report. So I'd say, you know, some of the, the ones that really are top of mind for me are around things like the zero-day vulnerabilities and the increases that we've seen, 180% increase in these types of activities, combined with things like the speed in which we see them being exploited, maybe compared and contrast against the timing that we see organizations being able to patch those vulnerabilities, for example. I'll give you a, a quick number. So what the report showed us this year was for, for organizations, it was about a median of 55 days to patch 50% of their critical vulnerabilities. Compare that against what we see the threat actors kind of moving forward against those vulnerabilities with exploit code, typically in about five days. So the time gap there is significant, and there's a number of different ways that organizations need to be looking at that. Um, and then obviously there's also things like the human element. We continue to see the human element playing a substantial role in the breach landscape. It's about two thirds of all the breaches have some element of the human involved, and it's. To be clear, not just things like inside jobs, like some people will sometimes think about. A lot of these are things like inadvertent, accidental errors. It may also be tied to things like social engineering attacks, where individuals are just kind of tricked and fooled into doing something that they shouldn't. That allows a threat actor into the environment. That huge increase in vulnerabilities being exploited is move it responsible for that big number? Move it is definitely a big contributor to that. So the, when the Move it vulnerability was released, we saw a substantial uptick in exploitation of that vulnerability. And honestly, our team got a lot of calls from organizations all over the world that initially they weren't even sure whether or not they were exposed. And then they subsequently found out not only were they exposed, but they actually had been breached and needed help with investigating those. So it definitely contributed a significant amount to that increase. Do we know yet 
the full extent of the impact? That with most of these things, the full extent of the impact has got a very long tail. And it's always challenging for us as we put the report together, because especially something that I'd say kind of falls into the category of being more systemic in nature, typically has a long tail. It can last years. You know, similar to what we saw previously with things like Log4j, which we talked about in last year's report, we're still seeing events tied to that even going into this year. So I anticipate MoveIt will be something similar where it will have a long tail as well. And Chris, it was interesting because with MoveIt, you also had the ransomware and extortion trend. Do you want to maybe talk about that? Sure. And then, yeah, that was a good data point from DBIR. That's absolutely right. So yeah, a lot of the MoveIt vulnerabilities, when they were exploited, they were exploited by ransomware groups in order to, to gain access to organizations. And what's interesting in this year's report, which I think Nazrin is alluding to, is we actually broke out for the first time the difference between things like ransomware and extortion. Historically, we really just viewed it through the lens of ransomware. And what's interesting is in this year's report, we actually saw for the second year in a row a slight decrease in the, the number of ransomware events that we actually saw. But interestingly, we saw a fairly dramatic uptick in the amount of extortion events that we saw. And that was kind of a change or a shift in terms of the tactics that the threat actors were using, where what we would actually find is instead of just going after organizations with things like a ransom attack, locking up systems, locking up data, they were going after them in new types of ways with things like denial of service attacks. And what we'd find is a lot of organizations being ill-prepared, not having some kind of DDoS uh, mitigation in place, and they would be susceptible in finding themselves now having to pay a different kind of ransom. So Nasrin, weigh in on how companies can uh, take preventative actions to keep that from happening. So, so definitely on, on the ransomware front, and we have seen, Gene, really good improvement across the industry, you would agree, uh, with, um, with companies addressing their backup recovery, vaulting of the critical data. But as Chris said, um, then the threat actor started shifting to would move it. It was just a file transfer uh, capability. And um, so now all of a sudden, they, they, they don't need to encrypt. They don't need to go through that. They, they now have the data. The practices, to answer your questions, are not very different. It's really understanding what set of software um, these types of um, uh, capabilities that the threat actors use, and how can you regularly protect yourself? For example, in my organization, we have a catalog of all the file transfer protocol. And then you ask yourself the question, do I need 500 of them? Not really. You really need to make sure that there is consistency of approach in the ways that the threat actors are um, in an extortion scenario um, using to take data out. So I always find DBIR and the data that comes out of it as a good tool to bounce against our strategy and say, are we doing the right thing? What do we need to think differently about? So when third parties are creating the vulnerability, what can companies do? Are there certain requirements they should make of vendors. Yeah, sure. On you. Yeah, sure. So we, we obviously have seen in the report a significant rise even also in things like supply chain and third party attacks. And that's actually something we've noted in the past as well, but it's continuing to climb. And the concern we have there is what we see a lot of organizations still doing today is essentially third party security by contract. They'll say, we've got a contract that says our third parties or suppliers need to do certain things, so we're covered. And the reality of it is what we find is when an event occurs, they still, their, their name is still getting put out there. There's reputational damage that for a lot of organizations, that can be very hard to quantify. So maybe they feel like they can try to settle it in court and try to you know, uh, be made whole from a litigation standpoint. That rarely solves the problem, and it tends to be, again, another kind of long tail event. And so what we find is organizations needing to kind of, what we talk about is supply chain illumination, actually get visibility to kind of the nth degree, if you will, of what that supply line looks like. Because a lot of times what we find is the third party may have third parties, who may have third parties. So you can see how this could get very complicated very quickly. And so I'll add to that, but in, it's truly a risk-based prioritization of your most critical third party that are critical to your ecosystem and treating them as an extension 
of your ecosystem. Uh, that effectively, to, to Chris's point, means you have continuous validation and analytics about where they have access to your um, environment. You actually know that real time, not when an incident occurs. You know where they've, whether they've been breached. You know their outside in posture on a regular basis. And you also trend and patterns when the relationship changes or True. augments within the enterprise. So you can have different um, set of interaction. Kyle, uh, I know you've been amazing when you ran the network for, for us. <laughs> yeah. You were my great sponsor mm. in taking some of the data that the team pulled together and having be part of your strategic review yeah. to truly making cyber security posture of your third party a critical component of a vendor management executive relationship. Yeah, I mean, yes, we did that. And I think it's super important. And it goes back to your point about day zero vulnerabilities. And I, I think the angle I take on this, this discussion is I, you know, these guys are based in the, 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 the bits and the bytes and what's going on. What's been interesting is I've turned, taken this role over a year ago, talking with CEOs and, and board members. It's, it's really apparent to me there's, there's many companies who have really good security posture. The world's a bell curve, right? And then there's others who don't think about it at all. And then there's the middle who thinks about it, but they're nervous. Because this is a highly complicated, highly complex thing, but it's a big risk to everybody's um, business, whether you're a huge Fortune 500 or you're a small, medium business. And so I think when I think about my role now, you know, uh, as opposed to what I used to be doing, is, is raising awareness and letting people know that you know, you're not by yourself. There's a lot of experts out there in the world who can help you improve your security posture. But the first thing is to understand there is a risk out there and that you should do something about it. And one of the risks is you can't just always assume if you buy a router or you buy a piece of gear that it does not have a day zero vulnerability into it. These folks have come up with protocols and ways to make sure that even if you do have a, a breach, you can isolate it and you can fix it and you can get on with business. So. Um, my, my role really right now is more about educating folks and getting people to, to understand the world, the, the hackers are getting better. They have more sophisticated uh, techniques and technologies. They can exploit things much quicker than they used to be able to. And so we're here to help people make sure that they can uh, protect their businesses. Chris, one of the things you mentioned that was striking to me was this delay on remediation. It seems to me speed is of the essence <laughs> Why isn't it happening faster? Sure. So I'll comment on that. I know Nazrin will probably have some great uh, add-on comments as well. So I think part of it is organizations struggle with the right balance. There's so many priorities that they have. And it's great to see that organizations are starting to recognize the need for cybersecurity, but they have finite resources, finite budget, finite technology. And so it becomes an equation of if I do more here, then I have to do less probably somewhere else. And it's a you know a bunch of different sliders. And so what we find is that some organizations are struggling to figure out not just the speed in which to address the problem, but the prioritization and the, the lens in which they should look at all of these things. Because in many cases, the challenges that they have to solve, they're not equal. This one, if I reduce it, might reduce my risk or my likelihood of a breach much more than somewhere else. But the cost or the impact of doing that may be somewhat different. So I think that's usually the challenge. And I know this is a hot topic for Nasrin, so I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I'd love that. Yeah, so it's, it, and I always talk about risk-based. And what when it comes to patch management, I really want to make sure this data doesn't become uh, a weapon we say patch more. Mm -hmm. um, patching more and do it rigorously is, is foundational. It's like basic, we got to do more. But it's really, to Chris's point, having a broader view of um, what are my critical assets? Do I have visibility to them? If I have, back to the conversation about third party and extension of many other third parties in my ecosystem, do I know what they bring to the table? Do I know where they connect? Do I have a view of their software bill of material and vulnerabilities that they're introducing to my environment? Do I have the right set of analytics to prioritize? Um, it's not always um, 
a one-to-one -one relationship with a critical vulnerability equal patch. A company architecturally or you know, how they have structured their environment, they may have ability to prioritize something differently. So it's this analytics ecosystem view, including third party, continuously validating that and, and making it easier for developers. I think fatigue has set in in the last year for both cyber defenders and the engineers in this constantly having to do zero day. So vulnerability. fatigue has fatigue, set in, fatigue. not urgency. Fatigue has set in. So what can we do as cyber defenders? Make it more automated, give them more analytics, give them more risk-based methods by which they can prioritize. Um, but sometimes for things that are extremely critical, like we had some VPN level attacks, software stack level zero day attack mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. Games, you know, like that one, you got to jump on. Because if it's exploited in the wild and it's a remote access to your company, um, all bets are off. You get a response in immediately. Kyle, did you want to weigh in on that? No, I, I think, um, once again, the discussion goes back to, and I always go back to, hey, I'm lucky that we have folks like this in our company that can think about this and talk about prioritizing. A lot of our customers, they, they don't even really know what a NIST framework is. A lot of them ask me a question like, how do I know if I'm good or bad? I don't, I don't even know. And just like keep getting awareness out there and letting people know that there's people that can help you bring you up on what NIST is and then how you can, how you can use it as a tool to understand where you're at in the, in the, the level of your security where you want to be. And then ultimately, though, it is up to businesses to make a decision on what risk do they really deem you know, a, a problem for them and make, a, make an economic decision. I think it's interesting, since we're in Washington, D.C., a lot of folks in government worrying about, you know, those who don't have, uh, like the folks we have at Verizon, um, what, can the government help them increase their uh, understanding of the situation and increase um, resources for them to help make them more vulnerable? Because a lot of this stuff is too, it's almost like, you know, if the bear's chasing you, whoever the slowest is kind of thing <laughs> happens, right? So, so um, maybe even in the playing field a little bit and getting more people and more uh, resources and funding available for uh, companies and even even small, yeah. like smaller governmental agencies, local agencies and the like to help them really increase their posture. And we think that's something that's worth worthwhile um, looking at and keeping moving that dialogue forward. Nasrin, the report shows that the human factor mm -hmm. is still key. There's been a lot of education around cyber cleanliness. Mm -hmm. Why is this such a problem? How do people like you address that? Good question. <clears throat> so. Let's start with the positive from the report. 20% more individuals are actually reporting. Correct. So that's goodness, meaning they were fished, and, and, but they recognize it. So that's goodness. It, so let's start with the positive. Um, why is it? Because I think in the digital world that we live, imagine every morning you get up, you get 50 emails, you get seven texts, you get you're constantly bombarded. Even your company sends you a text. So how do you know if a text is a legitimate text or is a bad guy text? Um, your IT guy may send you any. So it's, I think there, there is an opportunity to simplify the employee and contractor experience to know what's good, what's bad. At Verizon, we have this thing we, we use kind of what banking does. We say Verizon will never contact you over text with these kind of things. Right. It, so it simplifies the interaction. Especially with the AI these days, there is this dimension of phishing emails. They are no longer bad grammatically. Exactly. They are nice looking. Yes, they're they are. sophisticated. So they're no longer a tool that we can educate people to say, if it, if it looks a certain way, don't respond to it. So there's this continuous. Um, effort to make sure that you you understand what's going on in 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 the wild with the threat actors and how they are um, exploiting these set of text and email and messaging and voicemail and then how do you enable 
something different for your employee. To put but, a finer point on that, what you do, what Nazrin does is she actually sends us out spam and tries to fish us. <laughs> and, and actually it's super Have helpful because, it, by yeah, the way? well, <laughs> no, one time I did it on purpose to see what happened. But the, um, sure. the uh, no, 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 because they recognize it was because it spelled poorly, back to her point. But the, um, but this is all helpful. This is, she's helping train the, the employee base to be, always be on the lookout for, you know, for these kind of things. And probably, I, I never click on anything anymore. And then maybe five or six or seven years ago before I start, you started training us, I probably would have. So, you know, even things like that in training your workforce is super, super helpful. Yeah. So Chris, generative AI, which was mentioned here, has <clears throat> been uh, viewed with great fear in the cybersecurity community. What did your report find about how extensive it is? So that's an interesting topic because when we set out to put the report together, we, we always look at the data to see kind of what, what kind of bubbles to the surface. What is it that's going to be interesting to talk about that year? And oddly, generative AI didn't bubble up. It just kind of sat there at the bottom. The, the data didn't show why. anything. So I think ultimately what it comes down to is I think we're still very early in this cycle. I think there's a lot of hype. In fact, there's an interesting chart in the report where it shows the amount of times that we believe generative AI has been associated with a breach and the amount of times that people just generally talk about generative AI. And one of them is almost a flat line across zero, and one of them is a hockey stick chart up. And you could probably guess which one is which. We hear generative AI all the time, and the assumption is if I can see that it can write a better email for me or write an essay or whatever, it must be able to do all these other amazing things. And maybe it can or will. We've seen stories of people using it to create a phishing email that's better or to write malware. But I would say those are, right now, they're very much the outlier examples. And part of the reason why I believe that to be the case, and when we look at the data and talk with the team, what we see is the threat actors are finding that the methods that they're using today continue to work. And I say it's very akin to like regular crime out there in the world. If uh, someone is going to steal cars or rob a convenience store, their method of how they do it generally is consistent from one to the next to the next. They change their method when their method stops working. And so right now, we just don't see them evolving all that much to using it. It is something, though, that we'll be very much monitoring as we go forward, because I expect it will play a bigger role in the future. So that's the view from an incident perspective, and I agree with that. Having said that, CISOs need to think of AI and Gen AI as definitely an emerging risk, and a, also an emerging opportunity. Um, opportunity because we can, I talked to you about fatigue, um, cyber defenders fatigue. There are ways we can leverage Gen AI and AI, and vendors have been doing this with respect to AI for us for a long time. Machine learning and AI has been broadly used sure. and has really simplified our world. But we still have ton of tooling, ton of different ways we ask a, a, a SOC <coughs> analyst to go from this screen to this screen and to that screen and pull it all together. So there are ways that we can simplify that for, for a cyber defender. So that's the good side of it. Um, and, and I think the other element to this that cyber leaders and cyber organizations need to get integrated with their company is the AI strategy of their companies. What that effectively means that how is the company choosing to use AI in the, uh, for the use of their internal employees, optimization, creating new products, or changing mm -hmm. how we're doing it at Verizon, a lot of enhancement of our customer experience. There is an embeddedness of cyber into the life cycle of responsible AI framework, whether it's AI or Gen AI, doesn't matter, <coughs> that I think it's new for many organizations. And cyber needs to take an active role to be engaged. At a, at a high level for me, there's two things I worry about. First, I feel, and it's, we're not seeing it yet, I think your, your points are solid, I worry about it used to take a certain skill set to be able to be an effective cyber criminal. And I just, I just, at a high level, I feel these tools may take some, I had to be a level five coder, and now I could be a level two coder, and I can be just as effective as the level five guy. Yeah. So because of all the code that's out there. So I, I worry about that, that it brings more people into the fray uh, for them to be able to maybe be successful. 
Um, and then I, I also worry about zero day vulnerabilities because I'm not, I'm not expert enough in it to understand exactly how it's working. But at the end of the day, it's a whole new world. And does it create other holes for us, zero day holes that, that may just, they may not be there one day, but then the, the, the AIs change the algorithms or whatever the next day based on what it's learned, and then all of a sudden now you do have a hole. So those are the kind of things at a high level that kind of worry me. Is you said the, something that's very important, and so much of our tooling and capabilities in cyber is you have a system, you grab logs off to the systems, you analyze it, you respond to it. The, the LLM world, the black box of the data and what pops out requires a different interaction and with cyber defenders, with data scientists, and tied to the business logic and what you're trying to create for your company, and really looking at uh, red teaming some of those capabilities, yeah. understanding what the business is trying to do, what is the customer data that you're trying to create a capability, how could a threat actor exploit that? And that becomes almost part of the service um, an LLM based or a Gen AI or AI based capability that you're creating for our customers. For many of our customers, yeah. this is new. Yeah, and, and I want to add on to that too, because I think, you know, one of the headlines I, I kind of take away from what we've talked about as it relates to AI and the DBIR is that I think the biggest threat of AI for most organizations is, is internal to their company right now. And I think to Kyle's point, the future is looking exactly like I think you pointed out that it will make it such that it will be a, a lower barrier to entry for cyber criminals to, to start you know, producing these problems for us. But also at the same time, I think a lot of organizations, what I've seen over the years is it used to be organizations gathered as much data as they could because storage was cheap and they said, ah, this data could be useful later. Mm -hmm. Then organizations started having breaches and said, ooh, we should probably have data retention guidelines, get rid of data we don't need because it could be a liability, we start getting rid of data again. And now they look at it and say, the LLMs, they get fed by data. The more data we have, the better the LLM, the more efficient or the better results, we're back to collecting data again. And so I think there's the exact risks that Nazrin uh, pointed out in terms of how we're governing the use of that internally because it presents new and different risks than I think what a lot of organizations are prepared for. So Nazrin, going back for a moment to the fatigue factor, there's this wide array of risks. Some of them are here and now, some of them are emerging. How does someone in your position figure out the balance? Oh, such a good question. Um, I think uh, my deputy CISO is sitting there. I always say, we run cyber like a business. Meaning, you look at the external dynamics, you look at internal dynamics, you look at your strategy, your plan, what are you doing today? What do you need to plan for in a year, and in two year, and in three year? Um, so, um, and then you you really evaluate your emerging risks, and you ask yourself the questions: Which one is imminent? For which I need to action now? Which one do I have hor horizon to deal with? So, I believe AI is one that we have a year or two horizon for most enterprises to get their act together. Quantum computing is another one that we have about five to seven year horizon. That doesn't mean we start in five <laughs> years. That means we start probably this year with certain activities. The other elements that it's very tactical, but it's very educational, is that a lot of times cyber leaders run a lot of risk assessment, red teaming, pen testing, um, uh, adversary emulation, but they don't horizontally gather the data. So that analytics that you pull across all your weak points across your enterprise and your ecosystem also educate you on what you need to pro probably prioritize <coughs> sooner than later. Chris, I want to delve into a couple of additional things that um, the report bears on. One, I know attribution is difficult sure. in cyber world, but what are you seeing? Are you seeing new vectors? Geographically speaking. Yeah, so I mean, we definitely see geographic diversity in terms of the attacks. You know, we, we see things that are emanating from the US, we see things that are emanating from everywhere else in the world. I think the thing that's probably most interesting over the course of the last year is I think we're seeing more nation state activity entering the fold from what we had seen previously. You know, it's historically has been largely what I would say is organized crime groups, and nation state has been a very small sliver of what we see. And that's been the case for the last 
17-ish years. But what we're now starting to see is with all of the geopolitical tensions that are happening out there, we're seeing that more nation states are starting to enter the fold because we're seeing cyber as kind of a proxy for other actions that they might take or other ways for them to express dissatisfaction or disagreement, if you will. So are those nation states after something very different than the criminal organizations? The criminal organizations want money. That's right. What are the nation states pursuing? Yeah, so you're right. The, 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 the organized crime, they're looking for financially motivated types of you know gains. The nation states, they're typically looking more for things like intellectual property and trade secrets for either competitive advantages or for purposes of manipulation, sabotage. And obviously, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, recognize that we're in an election year, not just here in the U.S., but there's a tremendous amount of elections that are taking place this year across the globe. And so there's obviously a lot of concern about the potential for manipulation of information and systems that could also sway societies. Are you also seeing new collaborations? The casino hack that gets so much publicity was purportedly uh, perpetrated by Russians in conjunction with English-speaking hackers. Are you seeing more of those kinds of alliances? Yeah, we're definitely seeing more of those alliances, and I think part of that is the geopolitical tensions are bringing maybe some unlikely parties sometimes together because they perceive there being a, a common adversary that they may want to pursue. And so we're finding kind of some of those um, maybe unusual alliances actually taking shape. Geographical differences. You did break the 94 countries down into different regions. Did you find something different in, let's say, the Middle East and Africa? Yeah, so if we look across EMEA, one of the, the big differences that we saw there was a, a much higher rate of internally related uh, breaches. So for example, if we look at the entire data set, the majority of the events we see are from external threat actors. When we kind of zoom in and just look at EMEA, what we find is it's about 25% uh, about um, internal. So it's kind of a different shift in terms of you know what we see from the, that landscape. And similarly, from a, an Asia-Pac perspective, when we kind of zoom into that region, we also see a, a much bigger difference in terms of financially motivated versus espionage motivated attacks, where that has really flipped from what we've seen previously. And I think a lot of that just goes back to what I mentioned earlier around the geopolitical tensions is, is really kind of getting more parties kind of riled up and, and involved. I want to add something to what Chris said with respect to nation state. And there's been quite a bit of um, declassified information with respect to some of the nation state activities. and how they're looking to have foothold inside U.S. critical infrastructure. And it points out to the necessity, and you, you clearly mentioned that. Why? Why? Because it, it's, a, it's something to have to use for um, destructive form of attack at some point in time, to have a um, presence and pervasiveness inside critical infrastructure. So I take the angle of, OK, so what could um, practitioners do? Um, looking at their global footprint to really ensure that um, if you look at Volt Typhoon, for example, mm -hmm. as one particular TA, they, uh, they, they come into the ecosystem of, of a company through weaker points, um, a small, and medium business that does third-party relationship with a large company. Um, probably not as strong in terms of good configuration management of their endpoint, their firewalls, um, not up to date, end of life with a lot of systems and, and, and processes. Um, a lot of times lapsed in many companies are still the weak point because it's where you do collaboration, um, you kind of assume it's not connected to your network, but do you really know that? So it's really important for companies, large enterprises or smaller, to again look at this broader ecosystem and ask themselves the question, what should I do? Let's look at all the weak points, whether it's OT, whether it's lab, whether yep. it's third party entry point and say, are those strong enough and will they persist an attack? Uh, and, and really pull that continuous validation and monitoring. Look at, at inside your network log and see if you have any of these indicators of compromise. Really good amount of data shared by the US government to all industries 
with respect to some of these indicators of compromise. It's really critical absolutely. that we action those. Yeah, agree? And, yeah I, I would absolutely agree. And I think it's interesting, you mentioned kind of a lot of the work that the U.S. government has been doing, and I think that's been fantastic. I think we've seen great collaboration, public-private partnerships, data and information sharing that has really helped us move forward on a lot of these events that have occurred that I think otherwise might have been more, I don't know if I want to say catastrophic, that might be too alarmist, but could have been much worse for industry and the fact that the government has shared much more insights. And I think to Kyle's point earlier, it's not just about the large enterprises. The large enterprises, I think, have amazing resources to, to put on tackling this problem. A lot of the ones that really struggle are more of your small and medium businesses that they may not have a security department, they may not have even an IT department. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because, you know, I think it's, I don't know if it's Small Business Week or something like that. There's a big highlight going on around that um, right now. And, you know, one of the things that comes out of that is the fact that they are kind of the, the lifeblood of a lot of our economy. And so we can't forget about them and their need for cybersecurity. And then, you know, I think we start to see a little bit of a, a pivoting, a shifting, and a collaboration across the globe where other governments, I think, are also, you know, my team hears this from them all the time of how do they replicate some of the same things that we're doing, or how do we take some of the great things they're doing and replicate it here in terms of information sharing. And I know, Kyle, you had recently been traveling, I think, out to Asia and maybe yeah. Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to get your take on, do you hear the cybersecurity conversation notably coming up more around the world? Because I feel like it's a very hot topic oh, no. here. It's very, it's, it's every single conversation. And I think people look to us to talk to them about it because we're running, we're running networks for them. And we're providing them services and they want to look to us and say, hey, how can you help us? And I think, um, you know, and it's interesting because that's why I really think a lot now about the dynamic of big companies and small companies, how you set your posture up, how you set your framework up to deal with this. Once again, we're lucky and I, we have a best practice because um, Nasrin, you brought up the lab situation. So we've taken, Nazrin's an independent body. She, she's pulled out of all of the day-to-day -day operations. And I see a lot of people struggling with their securities embedded with say their CIO or say with the CTO in the labs. And then now somebody has to make a decision about business and security trade-offs. And it's much cleaner if you have somebody sitting outside and saying, hey, here's the real risk of this. And then you have the discussion about, about, the, um, about how you, how you take some of these on and how you remediate it and what's, what's priority. Because in, like, in a lab, I could see somebody who's running a lab, well, I have to get a product out. Right. And it needs to be out in 30 days, other my job's on the line. And hey, I understand I have a vulnerability, but that's just gonna take me off track and I'm not gonna care about it. So structuring your business in the right way so the right voices can be heard and people can make business decisions. And I hear that a lot, actually, from leaders. I'm not sure I'm set up that I'm getting, and I don't know enough about it to know if I'm making the right decision or not. And, sure. and I get that a lot, and that is universal no matter where I travel in the world. Especially with, um, I, I, I'd like to, to build on what you mm -hmm. said, um, SEC requirement inside U.S., we've seen similar requirement um, outside U.S. Really the independence of the cyber function in being able to be that advisor to the business, but also independently assessing risk and being able to come back to, to the leadership. Uh, ultimately, Kyle will make that decision, but I'll come to mm -hmm. him and say, here are the risk trade-off. That independence of the CISO to, to the leadership and to the board, it's really, really critical. Chris, to jump back to nation states for a moment. Sure. In the past, the ones I've heard named are China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. Are you seeing new major nation state players on the stage? So I'd say we're seeing kind of maybe others that are starting to kind of enter the fold that I would say are kind of either uh, allied or sympathetic to some of the activities of the ones that you mentioned. The ones that you mentioned are still very much alive, well, and active. And in some cases, we're seeing a lot of increases even with them. But I think you're starting to see, you know, more sympathetic actors that are kind of on the periphery or that maybe even getting support or acting as, say, a proxy um, for some of those kind of bigger names, if you will. So infrastructure was mentioned. Obviously, that's been a huge target for attacks here in the U.S. What else are you seeing in other sectors of the economy? 
So, I mean, obviously infrastructure is huge. Financial services is always a big topic. And then also I would say defense. Given what we're seeing going on around the world, there's a lot of interest in what does or where might there be soft spots in say the defense industry or even in say military complexes. And so there's kind of new interesting elements happening around things like operational technology security and IoT security. Historically, I think a lot of the conversation has been around IT security. And while I don't think we're done there, I think we've matured there a lot faster than we have in other areas. And I think now what you're starting to see is some of these industries that have operational technology or IoT are now coming back, having the same conversations they were having years ago about IT, saying, what do we need to be doing about OT and IoT? Because this is now a much bigger part of their environment. And in some cases, it may be parts of the environment that they don't even really fully have their arms around how big it is. Uh, we would love to take your questions. We have some people in the room who may have some, and we have some people on the line um, who would like to start things off. And if you could tell us who you're with, that would be great. Yes, Tim Starks with CyberScoop. Um, you mentioned uh, what might happen in the future with AI in a report like this. I'm curious how much you're able to extrapolate future trends based on what this report says this year. That's a great question, Tim. So I think, you know, we we very much try to look at that. So one thing I'll say is when we put the report together every year, we really look at it from the lens of what the data shows us so we can kind of really hone in on the hard facts. So we try not to get too much into speculation in the report, just because obviously there's a lot of things that can change the direction of where that goes. But I would say very much to what Kyle mentioned earlier in terms of if I could kind of look in my crystal ball and say looking at what we've seen happening over the last year and where we would anticipate things going with the capabilities and the power of generative AI, uh, you know, I think we, we can speculate in terms of the direction that it might take is, you know, whether it is assisting social engineering, writing new malware, or even coming up with a more automated, scalable way of going after attacks. You know, one of the things that, that Gina had mentioned earlier was the, the prevalence of zero days and the challenges that organizations have had with patching them in a timely enough fashion to address their risks. And I could see there being a future where something like AI or generative AI could allow a threat actor to not just create the code to exploit it, but potentially move within the environment, find other targets, you know, acquire credentials, and actually advance the attack more programmatically than what we see today, where you know, much of the attacks, there may be automated components to them, but there's, I'd say, a lot of manual effort that is still involved but not looking to give the threat actors too many ideas. <laughs> Sorry, I might phrase the question a little poorly. Okay. I was also wondering about other trends outside of AI. Oh, okay. Okay, and let me repeat sure. the question yes. so the online audience can hear it. Uh, Tim was asking about other trends outside of AI. So in, in terms of forward leaning, I think that, yeah. So th there's a number of different things that we're always looking at there. I think the human element is a big piece that we see as we're, we're looking to continue to see that knock down. And I think that organizations are placing more and more effort in things like security awareness training. So I think we're gonna see that trend continue to improve, albeit the trend has been slowly improving. So while I would imagine it'll continue to decline, I think it's gonna be quite some time before we see a lot of meaningful change there. I think also when we look at things like the vulnerability elements, I think we're gonna see that organizations are gonna be getting better in things like uh, quantitative risk management, where they're actually looking at things more through a prioritized lens. So maybe the time from when a threat actor exploits something to the time an organization patches may be less important because there's other things the organization has done to address the risk. And then also I'd say more of security by design and embedded elements, you know, even just what we're looking at here in terms of how do we make our own network connectivity more secure such that for things like, you know, small businesses, maybe they have to worry about that a little bit less um, in order to be able to achieve, you know, a more positive security outcome. I, I want to add something to what Chris said is, uh, and something I say to my board, I will never ever not have an identity and access management program that I say done, because it's never done. Um, and, and really looking at the constant evolution of your identity and access and authentication of how you interact with your customers and employees in all of these threat scenarios is paramount. So I think from a practitioner's perspective, both strategically and tactically, you got to very constantly say, how could 
a digital end-to-end -end process be exploited from an identity perspective. That's really, really critical. And you, you talk about stolen credential, but it comes with that all the different ways that the threat actors exploit identity. Absolutely. And identity controls. And, and that's, that's really critical. Um, it's a big focus area for us. Inside my organization, my BSOs, business information security officers, are very much aligned with their businesses around any change in customer or partner experience with respect mm -hmm. to all of these um, channels and identity. And I would also maybe just add one more thing into that as well that I'd say as you were kind of talking about identity and access management, made me also think of how, you know, I think more and more organizations are going to lean in the direction of things like passwordless. As we've seen to your point about the stolen credentials, you know, that, that continues to be an ongoing challenge. And so the more we can find other or alternate ways to address um, identity and, and access management and authentication, I think will be a substantial improvement for us. We have another question. Yes, I'm Lauren Schultz with Verizon. And Chris, you mentioned uh, small businesses. And one of the questions that came in through our LinkedIn community was, in particular, what can cybersecurity professionals do to help small businesses that may be struggling with their cyber issues? If you don't have a large enterprise business, Nazrin, like we do here, what are some things that a small business owner can do? Sure. So I, I think there's. Do you need me to repeat the question for the online audience? No, we don't. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Go ahead, so I, I think there's a number of things, and it starts with, I think, information sharing. Because when I get out there and have an opportunity to speak with the small business community, a lot of times this is a, a very new topic for them, or their exposure to it is, you know, headlines. And they're, they're maybe scared, but they're not sure what to do, and they may not even necessarily know where to go. Um, I encourage everybody to check out a lot of the, the webcasts that we do because we really do put a lot of great content out there, or at least I think it's great content, uh, for the small business community to try to help them understand what that looks like and what are the steps that they can do, really kind of breaking it down because the maturity level is vast. You have some people who they may have never even heard of ransomware, and then some that are deathly scared that it'll take out their small business and they want to know what to do. Um, so I know we'll have a series of other webinars that we're going to be doing throughout the day and ongoing that I'd encourage anybody who may be listening that's interested or that maybe serves the small business community to check that out because I think there's a lot of great content out there, and it, it starts with the education. I, I, I want to add to that, Lauren, and say adopt the business. You know, I, I look at the third parties that are part of our customer service process as an extension of ours. So when we do deep, dark web monitoring and we find anything about any of them, we contact them. So it's, that's what I mean. Adopt the business. They're part of your ecosystem, so they're extension of you. They, can't, they don't have the capabilities that you have, so how do you share intelligence, what you know? with them. And on the other side, how do you ensure that technically that they have the capabilities to support your business? Uh, e equally applies to our open source software. Yes. You know, we talk a lot about many of the vulnerabilities that we uh, dealt with in the past year were around open source software. There's still this culture that open source software is free. Use it, doesn't matter how critical your product is, you're good to go, it's not. And a lot of large companies support, sponsor, uh, very large, you know, projects, you know. Uh, but many of us use small, single maintained OSS projects. Adopt one of those. Be part of um, contributing to bringing up the security of some of those entities. Do we have another question right here? Thank you, uh, Eva Doe from the Washington Post. Um, I'm curious uh, if a product is made by a company that's not viewed as a secure vendor, is it possible to use it securely um, based on using your own software or encryption or things like that? Because um, like you hear this discussion around like Huawei routers, around DJI drones and other products. Um, on one hand, you have people who say, you know, if the vendor's not trusted, this cannot be trusted. And then you have people who are willing to use it who also know something about cybersecurity and who say, you know, there's, there's a way to use it securely. 
I can take a step. Sure. Yeah, I'll jump in. I, I think <laughs> you use Huawei as an example, but I just broadened the, the conversation. I think we've taken a, you know, being a U.S. company, a very um, strict approach into what we will use and not use. Um, outside U.S., there have been different approaches. Um, one approach could be um, some have decided that they will not use the product in their core, but they will work it at, they will place it at the edges mm -hmm. of their network. Uh, every company makes a cost-based strategy, risk-based decision. Uh, we are a U.S. company, and we've taken a very strong position that certain banned products we will not use inside right. our environment. Because they have more risk. That's Once again, risk. ask risk, and I have a trusted vendor. And I'm sure you can get yourself comfortable if you put enough wrappers around things to feel comfortable for some period of time. But um, but we'd rather, as, as Nazarin said before, we want to work with partners where we understand deeply how they make their gear, where they source their gear, what their firmware is, all of that kind of thing. And that's what we kind of demand from the people that we put in our network. And uh, that's kind of, that's, that, that works well for us because we have a very deep understanding of, of the boxes we put in the network and the software that rides on top of it. If I could follow up on that question, the DJI drones are used extensively even within U.S. law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So this question of whether they can be contained has national security implications. So could somebody address the question outside of the I, I'll, I'll take a stab at one. Uh, there's, I think there's also the level of risk once again. So one drone is one drone. If you have a massive piece of iron in the network that's handling, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigabits of traffic, that's a different, that's a different ball game, right? So there's a point solution that, okay, all right, what, what can you do with that other than you have a whole network that could be infected with something that could be used nefariously? So I think there's, once again, you got to look at the risk of these different things. And I also, we haven't talked about product security at all today. Right. We talked a lot about IT, but there is a complete discipline around hardware and software security that many enterprises follow. Um, I think just about all my peers these days have responsibility for both product and cyber kind of think traditional enterprise security. And in the space of product, you look at hardware component, software component, uh, how that solution then gets integrated with other components and gets into a customer environment. So there is an accountability. Like for us, it's not just, I think mm -hmm. you have a very good point about what we accept on our network, mm -hmm. but there is also the secondary point of we service many large enterprises, and they have very specific right. requirements. Yeah. It's the role of product security to really ensure that is looked at end to end. And, 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 and we've also, to, to be honest too, we've we've taken we've taken vendors who are trusted vendors out of our network because they didn't have the cyber kind of requirements requirements that we that we require. So there's even been not Huawei's. There's been others that are trusted that we've had to take some gear out because we didn't like the way they had their they didn't they meet were, our requirements. So. Uh, one more question. Yes, there's one, one more question. So again, uh, Carlos with, uh, uh, with Verizon. So thanks everybody for all the questions that you're submitting on LinkedIn. Uh, we have one question here. So um, what, have you what have you changed your mind about in the last year regarding cybersecurity? And they're asking it for each of the panelists. Mm -hmm. If you've changed your mind. <laughs> Ooh, that's a great one. Um, I'm happy to try to start with that one and see where we go with it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, for, for me, there's a lot of things, having looked at this for the last 17 years of DBIR, I've been a part of it from the very beginning. I think there's an amazing amount that has stayed the same, and that's always kind of interesting to see. I think what we're finding is some of the newer technologies. I think, uh, you know, like generative AI, like quantum, these are things that I think are, they have the potential to change my mind and many others in terms of what the risk landscape looks like and how we need to approach security. For example, when we look at things like quantum, you know, I have a lot of conversations with people about what the risk is and, you know, Nazrin pointed out earlier, well, that's maybe a years down the road thing and maybe some organizations aren't even looking at it yet because they feel like they have time. But the reality of it is also that there's a lot of data that has already been exposed in the outside world over the last several decades that people thought were safe because it was encrypted. That now in the future, what we thought that was safe 
now may all become exposed. And so there's a whole new level of, I'd say, concern and privacy implications around things that we've not yet even seen how they will come to, to bear, but we expect that they will, they will show up in that way. And so there's, I think, going to be a whole new set of considerations we need to look at, and maybe even changes to the way we look at things like uh, privacy. Nazrin? So I don't know if so much I've changed my mind or I evolved my mind to have less patience for this, meaning uh, we talked about threat actors. We talked about the median of five days, zero days, you know, the peaks and valleys of 100, 50, 90, um, fatigue of our, um, of our workforce, the fact that we got to be ready for quantum, the fact that we got to get S-bomb from every third party. And then I go, I say, I have no patience for manual work. And, and, and we need to drive more automation, more continuous validation, and taking the work out of human beings, have to tell you, this is right or wrong and systems and applications and automation got to be the way that we got to buy time for that five minutes that's going to become four, three, and two. So that's the, my evolution. Uh, and that's where um, we're driving our strategy inside Verizon. For me, my, my, it's, it's, I think my thinking just evolved, maybe and expanded, where I would always think about Verizon, our networks, our systems, and our customers to more about the whole, what does this mean for the country? And how can we play a role in helping those, once again, who don't even understand, get better and build their security posture so they're in a, they're in a better position? I think that's something that's, that's, that's taken more of my MIPS <laughs> in, the last, in the last year, if you will. Yeah. Um, Nasrin and Chris, thank you both so much for your participation. Yeah. Thanks to you too, Kyle. Well, but you're going to get the very last word. Oh, I so get the last gotta, word. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I so well, I'll, hand it back to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was a great session, and I appreciate everybody here in the room and online for joining us today. I'd encourage you. We always get very excited about DBIR Day. Um, you know, as you can see, we take it uh, very seriously. It's it's in it, it's embedded in our culture. We think about this all the time. And we're excited that we're able to be able to share information and data that can help, once again, to my last point, help everybody in, in, in improve their security posture. So I'd, I'd encourage you to get a hold of the report, look at it. I'd encourage you to reach out to us if you need any help with any of your business needs around cyber. We have great experts, as we just saw today. And uh, we're here to help the customers we have today and any new customers. So I appreciate everybody's time and have a great rest of the day. Great. Thank you all.